Hello everyone, how are you? Fine, sir. Fine, sir. So we will begin shortly. Okay, so last time uh, we talked about uh, in detail the class B. Class B, and then we also talked about the class N. We did not go into details about class NP in last class. Today we will explore it further. So do you have any questions about that? Um, sir, uh, in the last class we saw that if we have a solution which we call a certificate and we pass it on to a TM, which is a verifier, and if it is verifiable in, a, in polynomial time, then we say that the problem is in NP, right? Yes. But uh, is it possible for the verifier to check if a given problem is, uh, sorry, if a given solution is not the solution to the problem? Uh, not the solution to the problem. Like what see, will happen in that case? See, 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 the verifier is a deterministic clearing machine, right? And it's not just deterministic, it's, it's a deterministic uh, decider. So a, a decider decides both things, right? When, so for example, uh, when we pass a solution, it checks whether that solution is correct or not. So if it is correct, then it accepts. If it is not correct, it rejects. So if you want to do the other way, you can just flip the outputs and it will it will work the way you want. Oh, okay. So basically it will decide in any case, it will tell us if it's not the solution, say it's, uh, it will actually reject it, right? Yes, it will decide. <clears throat> so, okay, so, thank you. so last time, yeah. So last time we talked about verification. So let us, um, let, let us define the verification a little bit more formally, right? So we say that a verifier, remember verifier is an algorithm, right? So a verifier or a language A is an algorithm where Okay. So over here, the C is basically the certificate. So we say we measure, we find Okay. 
So we measure the time of verifier only in terms of the length of W and not in the length of C, where C is a certificate. We don't measure, so C does not uh, have any impact on, on the running time. Okay. Yes. Is W a string as well? W is the input string. Yeah, W is a, w is a string. Okay. So we say that a polynomial time verifier runs in polynomial time in the length of W. Okay. And we say. See a language A is <clears throat> polynomial verifiable if it has a polynomial verifier. Okay. So verification is done by an algorithm, okay? And we already talked about what that algorithm could look like. For example, um, uh, let's say I asked you that write a program uh, that takes an input, an array, a list of n numbers, and checks if this array or the list is in sorted order, right? It is not going to perform any sorting. It will just tell you yes it is sorted or no it is not sorted okay so this is a kind of verifier or a verification algorithm right and you know that this verification algorithm runs in polynomial so by this token the problem of sorting is also a problem which is in np right so we we have a definition we have a definition for the class np so we say the class np so let us define what is the class NP. So we say NP is the class of languages that have a polynomial time, that have polynomial time verified. Okay. So this is the definition of NP that we talked about. Last time. So if for any problem, if it can be verified in polynomial time on a deterministic Turing machine, then the problem is in class NP. And uh, with this simple definition, we know that the class P that we already defined becomes a subset of class NP. Because in class P, all the problems, are, I mean, class, all languages that are in class P or all problems that are in class P have a solution in polynomial time, right? So every language in P can be decided in polynomial time on a deterministic machine. So if something can be decided in polynomial time on a deterministic machine, it can also be verified in deterministic time on, uh, on in polynomial time on a deterministic machine. So by default, we know that the class P is subset of class NP. But the other way, that is P, uh, the other way, which is NP is a subset of P or not, is a question. So we do not know. We do not know anything about this. This is unknown. Okay, so let us move on and define more things. And uh, we have a theorem. It's a simple theorem. We say that a language is in the class NP if and only if. It can be
Okay. So we have this theorem which says that <clears throat> that says that suppose we have a language A. So we say that this language A is in class NT if and only if we can rewrite if and only if as this arrow, if and only if, if and only if there exists a non-deterministic Turing machine in such that N decides A in polynomial time. Okay, so this is, I mean, whatever that I've written over here as a theorem, is also written here in mathematical form. Okay, so we can say that A is So this is the mathematical equivalent of the theorem. This isn't clear. So um, we are not going to prove it, uh, but try to understand the state. Okay? And then we will contrast it with the definition of class P. So when we talked about class P, we said that a language A is in class P if and only if there exists a deterministic Turing machine M such that M decides A in polynomial time. Okay, so you see the difference between these two definitions, the definition of NP and definition of P. So I, I said that we, we cannot, we cannot stress this in stress is stress it enough to, uh, to say that this non-determinism is one of the most important thing in the definition of P and NP. So when we talk about P, the Turing machines that we talk about are deterministic Turing machines. When we talk about NP, the Turing machines that we talk about are non-deterministic, okay? So there is no change in polynomial time. In both the cases, the definition requires that the decision so, so the, the definition requires that the deciding by the Turing machine happens in polynomial time. The only difference is that in class P, it has to be deterministic, while in class NP, it has to be non-deterministic. Okay, that's the only difference. So when we say that we have a class P, uh, and when we say that we have a class NP, some people say that this N over here means non-polynomial. This is completely incorrect. This is wrong. This is not correct. N over here in the NP represents non-determinism. N does not mean anything or it doesn't have anything to do with non-polynomial. It only means non-deterministic, okay? It refers to, or it, it uh, points to non-determinism present in, in, the, um, uh, in the Turing machine. Is this thing clear? Okay, so if you remember, we defined, um, we defined D time, right? Or just time. We def similarly, we define n time, which is the non-deterministic time. So we define non-deterministic time. So we, we say that the non-deterministic time or n time, Tn is L <clears throat> such that L is decided by n O of C of n time. Okay. 
Now, once we have, let's say we have a Turing machine. Let's say this is an NTM Turing machine N. It takes the input X, then it accepts or rejects. An exception, accepting or rejection means that we, so this non-deterministic uh, Turing machine N is, is, is basically uh, answering the membership queries for the underlying language, right? So there must exist some language L, so I think this L of N is the language, right? So this is the language. Now, whenever we sure. have a, yes. Um, is it uh, a small O or a big O in OTN? It's big O. Whenever I write O, okay. it means big O, unless I say it's small O. Okay, so let me write it uh, even more clearly. Okay, so, so if we have some non-deterministic Turing machine N and it takes input X, then it will either accept or reject. When it accepts, it means that X belongs to the language. When it rejects, X does not belong to the language because um, any Turing machine with any decider basically uh, checks the membership parties, right? Now, in order to process all of that, uh, this non-deterministic Turing machine N has to do some work, right? It has to do some work. And that work is basically the number of steps taken by the non-deterministic Turing machine. So what happens in a non-deterministic Turing machine is there's a single entry point which starts at the Q0, which is the starting state. And from that starting state, it may end up in multiple states at the same time because it's a non-deterministic Turing machine. But remember this non-deterministic Turing machine is a decider. So there might be some paths which it will go and some paths will die out because they cannot proceed, but there must exist one path such that it will lead to either accept or reject, right? Either accept or reject. So there might be multiple paths which lead to accept. There might be multiple paths which lead to reject, but it will either accept or reject. So when there are multiple paths which take the machine from the initial Q0 to either Q accept or Q reject, uh, what we need to find out, we need to find out the that if there are multiple paths, then we need to find, figure out what is the maximum path. And once we find the maximum path, we will just count the number of steps taken by the machine from going, uh, going from Q0 to either Q except or Q reject. And we will count those steps, right? And that number basically means the time complexity of this non-deterministic Turing machine N. Now, whatever is the number of steps, that number of steps will definitely depend on the size of the input. Right? It will definitely depend on size of the input. So we say that, let's say Tn is a function, okay? Tn is a function which measures, measures the time, okay? That is number of steps by the non-deterministic Turing machine N, okay? Non-deterministic Turing machine N. Then we say that n time tn. Why n? Because this is about the non-deterministic machine. So if I don't have n, it means just deterministic Turing machine. But when we put this prefix n before time or before anything uh, in, in, in complexity in, in automata, it means that we are talking about non-deterministic, right? So non-deterministic time tn means that the language L, which is over here, is decided by a non-deterministic Turing machine n in time O of Q of N. Okay. Is this thing clear? Yes, sir. Okay. Now we had a very similar result for P and for P we said that P, the class P is basically uh, the union of all the time n power k, where k was greater than or equal to zero. So similarly, we have np, which is union of all n time, n power k for k greater than or equal to zero. So this is the definition of np, okay? 
So NP contains, so this class NP contains all those languages which can be accepted by a non-deterministic Turing machine in time O of N, in time O of N squared, in time O of N cube, and so on. So this union will give us all those languages for which we can construct a non-deterministic Turing machine which run in time. Uh, let me make a small change here. Let's take greater than zero. So O of N, O of N squared, O of N power three, and so on and so forth. All these languages, so there might be infinitely many languages which can be decided by a non deterministic Turing machine in time O of N. There might be infinitely many languages which can be decided by a non deterministic Turing machine in time O N squared and so on and so forth. And remember, this N is the length of the or the size of the input. Okay. Okay, so there are some questions in chat. Uh, is my voice lagging? Yes, sir, in between it lags. Okay, so there might be some internet issues. Is it for everyone? Okay, uh, all of the parts from all of the parts from, I don't know, what does it mean? Um, okay, so. So what, what does it mean? What does uh, it mean by D time and N time? Is that the question? Can you ask your question, please? Is, is this thing clear to everyone? Yes, sir. Any questions? Can you tell me what's n time and d time? What do you mean by can I tell you? Uh, I just explained what it is. This is the definition of n time. Oh, okay. I, oh, okay. So by n time and d time, we mean whenever I write n time and I write d time. So what do I mean by that? I, I mean that it is a collection of languages okay it's a collection of of languages okay so which collection of languages it will only me make any sense if i write what collection of language i'm talking about for example i say that i'm looking at n square okay n time n square means what does it mean it means all those languages which can be decided by a non-deterministic feeding machine in O of N square time. Okay, so there might be infinitely many languages all those languages which can be accepted by, accepted by uh, which can be decided by a non-deterministic Turing machine in O of n square time are in n time n square. Okay. Similarly, I can define n time n cube. I can define n time n power four and so on and so forth. So n power n time n power three or n, n time n cube means that all those languages which can be decided by a non deterministic machine in uh, n cube time then n four time and so on and so forth. So if you drop this prefix n, it means that we just change this ntm into dtm, that is a deterministic Turing machine. 
everything else remains the same. Okay. So as we did uh, with the class B, and we saw examples yes, of yes. Sir, I have one question. Uh, for the problems, for the NP problems, why do we use the non-deterministic TM? Is it because we don't have, uh, we cannot reach a solution? Because we cannot reach a solution. No, I don't understand your question properly. What do you mean by we cannot reach? Like, oh, sorry, I meant, um, for for example, for the problems in the in the class P, we are using the deterministic TMs, right? Yes, yes. So why are we using uh, non-deterministic TMs for the NP problems? Why we are using? Uh, this is how we define them, right? So there must be a reason behind it, right? Why do uh, we need NTMs for it? Can we not use DTMs for NP problems? Okay, um, let, let me, do you remember the theorem where we, we uh, where, where I gave um, a slowdown theorem? I mean, do you remember the slowdown theorem? Uh, slowdown. That was, yeah, that was that, for example, if there is a language, let's say a language A, can be decided by a, a non-deterministic Turing machine in time of t of n, for example, then it can be decided by a deterministic Turing machine in time of two power of t of n. Do you remember that? Oh, yes. Yes, we did. Yes. Right? So it means that this theorem and the underlying implication of this theorem was that. And I think that uh, that is also evident from uh, when we talked about DFAs and NFAs. Do you remember the discussion about DFAs and NFAs? So we talked uh, that computationally speaking, Both DFA and NFA are the same, right? So whatever that a DFA accepts can be accepted by an NFA, and whatever that an NFA accepts can be accepted by a DFA. Do you remember that? So computationally, yes, DFAs and NFAs are equivalent, right? So you can always convert an NFA into a DFA, or you can you can rewrite a DFA as, as an NFA. So computationally, they are the same. But the, the difference, but but if if they are if computationally they are the same, then why do we have NFAs and DFAs? Uh, the reason was that uh, sometimes it is easier for us to define an NFA rather than a DFA, and vice versa. And not only that, there was another subtle difference, which is the, which is the most important difference, and that is the concept of non-determinism itself is important. So when we say a machine is non-deterministic machine, it gives us uh, the ability uh, that the machine can be, I mean, it, it gives machine this ability that machine can be in multiple states at the same time, right? It can be in multiple states at the same time. So there is this uncertainty. There is this probabilistic or non-deterministic nature of those machines. So we have a similar uh, thing going on for DTM and NTM. So if we have um, a non-deterministic Turing machine, uh, for example, sorry, if we have a deterministic Turing machine or a non-deterministic Turing machine, computationally they are the same. That is, everything that can be decided by a non-deterministic Turing machine can be decided by a deterministic Turing machine, and vice versa. But the thing is that when you try to look at the working of a non-deterministic Turing machine, you see uh, this, this tree, right? This tree of computation. While in DTM, there's a single entry point and each and every step is predetermined that what this machine will do next, right? It is exactly determined by whatever that is on the input tape and whatever this, the current state of the machine is. 
The machine cannot be in multiple state at the time. It can only be in one state at a time. Why it is not true in an NTM? So in NTM, uh, so a non-deterministic machine can be in multiple states at the same time. So it can do um, exponentially. So we can think about it that if all those branches are, are working at the same time, so it means that we are not talking about one machine. We are talking about multiple machines at the same time. So you can see that at every point, every such point where the machine has the ability or, or it, it, it makes a choice whether to go to one path or, or the other path, it actually goes to both paths at the same time, right? So you can think about that the, the machine spawns itself. It, it spawns a clone of itself, right? And that clone will explore that path. And there is another clone that will explore the other path. And at every point, whenever there is a choice, whenever there's a multiple choice for the machine to go into multiple states, uh, there is a separate path that does the computation. And those computations happen all at the same time in parallel, right? All of them happen in the parallel. But there is no uh, physical equivalent of a non-deterministic machine or uh, I mean, any non-deterministic machine. So, so whatever we are saying over here is just abstract. It's, it's a mathematical concept. We imagine that all those paths are explored at the same time, right? So you can imagine that rather than exploring all those paths one by one, let's say there are 100 paths, and you have to explore all those paths one by one, and, and imagine there are 100 machines which each machine explores one path at the same time. So you can imagine the time complexity would be much different in non-deterministic case than in the deterministic case, right? So we, first of all, we focus ourselves on the deterministic machine. And we say that let's suppose we have a language and that language can be decided by a deterministic machine. And we just measure the number of steps taken by the machine to solve that problem, to, to accept a particular string in that language. And we just count the steps and we find out what is the relationship between the length of the input and the number of steps. Then we figure out that maybe it's 2n, maybe it's n square, maybe it's 2n cubed minus five, and or whatever. Maybe it's all non, right? And that polynomial will exactly determine the time complexity of, of that uh, of that language, right? Deciding that language, the the time complexity of, of that deterministic Turing machine. But when we say that a particular non-deterministic Turing machine decides a, a, a string of length n in time O of n, what does it mean? What does it even mean? So when I say that, suppose, so suppose. There's a language A and there's a language B, okay? For language A, there exists a, a deterministic Turing machine M, and for language B, there exists a non-deterministic Turing machine N, okay? M decides A in time O of N, for example, and N decides B in time of n. So, so there is no relationship between A and B. They could be completely different languages. We are, and we are not concerned what those languages are. What we are only concerned is that is the time complexity. So you can imagine that the time complexity in both the cases is O of n, right? When it is deterministic, you know what does it mean? It means there exists only one path, and that path is of the maximum length. Okay, there's only one path such that where n is the length of the input and it will take uh, the time which is linear in terms of the length of the input. While when we come to the non-deterministic part, the machine n, when I say that the time is linear, it means that from the starting point, okay, from the starting point, there might be multiple paths, many different paths, but there must exist at least one path which leads from q0 to Q except for example, or Q reject, okay? And, and there might be multiple such paths which, which lead, which go from Q0 to Q except for Q reject. There might be multiple. But this particular path, which I highlight in, let's say, uh, highlight here. So this particular path, this particular path has the maximum length. It only tells us that this particular path has the maximum length. It does not tell us anything about 
how many more paths are there is there only is there only one path or is there multiple paths or how many paths are there which do not lead to any solution they just die out because machine can cannot proceed in in some of those paths so it does not tell us anything about all those machines or all those um, i mean uh, virtual machines which exist uh, which which happen uh, to come up with which which help uh, to decide right so it does not tell us anything about it, right that's why non determinism is is a powerful technique because even though for those questions which which uh, which can be decided in in polynomial time on deterministic machine that's perfectly fine but there are some problems which cannot be or at least we do not know if they can be decided in polynomial time on deterministic machines but they can be they can be um, decided in polynomial time on non deterministic or at least we can verify the solution uh, in polynomial time on non deterministic machines so that's why we have this np and p right so this class p when we talk about class p it means that we talk about all those problems which are uh, problems which can be solved in reasonable amount of time on a realistic computer while all those problems in np are those problems which are probably not the problems which can be solved in reasonable amount most probably they will take a lot more time than the problems their counterparts in in the class p so this n tells us that this is not going to be an easy problem okay but remember class p is inside the class np so everything that is in p is also in np it means that not all problems in np are are difficult some problems in np are definitely easier than other problems right so there are problems which are outside p so they are definitely difficult and as a, and a yesterday and uh, i mean day before yesterday i said that there are some problems which are outside class np which are very difficult and there are some problems in np which we call them as special problems which are even they are they are even more harder i mean they are harder than many other problems in np so so we we do not have uh, exact classification right now but we know that there are problems which are easier there are problems which are hard and there are problems which are in, in middle in between so this n this, this the significance of this prefix n is that uh, we are talking about problems which are not easy to solve, or at least we haven't found an efficient solution for those problems as yet is this thing clear yes sir okay, okay. so so when we uh, talked about class p we talked about some examples in class p so we now we talk about class np so let's talk about some examples um of languages or problems in class n okay so there is a problem which we call the clique problem do you know what is clique no sir okay suppose there is a graph g okay g is an undirected okay uh, so let's say this is the graph uh it could be any end of the graph let's say this is this is the graph maybe one more for x here okay so this is uh, a graph an undirected graph so let's label those graphs or maybe we can give them numbers so this is vertex 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 so there are nine vertices right so in this graph so whenever we have a graph we can define a subgraph i hope you know what is a subgraph do you know what is a subgraph not exactly but it will consist of a few of the nodes of the graph g yeah a subgraph of a graph is a graph that is obtained from the graph by removing some vertices and corresponding edges for example if i look here so this is a subgraph right this is a subgraph of the original graph uh this is a subgraph okay this is a subgraph so there are many subgraphs here right this is a subgraph and maybe this is a subgraph and so on and so forth so there are multiple different definitions i mean there are multiple different classifications as well for example induced subgraph and proper subgraph so so we are not going there. so there is a subgraph right 
So there is a concept of subgraph. There is you because we know that a graph is basically a, a, a couple. A, it's a pair of vertices and edges, and both vertices and edges are basically sets. And so we can we can do everything that we do with sets to graphs. So for example, we can find a subset of vertices. So imagine that G is a graph uh, with V and E. So we say that G prime is a graph, uh, which is V prime and E prime, such that uh, we say that G prime is a subgraph of G, such that V prime is a sub subset of V and E prime is also a subset of V. E. That is, we remove some vertices or we don't consider some vertices from the original graph. And uh, we also don't consider all the corresponding edges. For example, if you say that I remove uh, this vertex, then of course we would not consider this edge or this edge, right? Because these edges will be dangling. Anyway, so we say that whenever give, given an undirected graph, in this undirected graph, we can find a subgraph of a graph, which is a complete graph. Do you know what is a complete graph? Uh, in which each node is connected to all the other nodes? Yes, a complete graph is an undirected graph such that every vertex is connected to every other vertex. So let me give you some examples of complete graph. So this is a complete graph of one vertex. This is a complete graph of uh, two vertices. And n is the number of vertices is one, n is two. So this is a, this is a complete graph of n equal to three. Uh, this is the complete graph of uh, n equal to four. Uh, sorry, n equal to four. This is the complete graph of n equal to five. And so on, right? So these are the complete graph. Complete graph means that every vertex is connected to every other one. So given, given an undirected graph, okay? Given an undirected graph, okay, and an integer k, such that this k is less than the number of vertices, which is equal to n, right? Thus, g contain a clique of size a. This is the question. So clique means, clique means, so whenever I write clique, clique means a subgraph that is complete. Okay, so if you go back over, uh, go back to our uh, graph, we can find out there are many different uh, cliques here. So let's uh, do a simple example. Uh, suppose I have this graph. This is an undirected graph, and I can see that this subgraph of the original graph is a clique of size three, right? Because there are three vertices here, and these three vertices form a subgraph, which is a complete graph, because there is an edge between every vertex of this subgraph. So this is a clique of size three. Is there a clique of size four in this graph? No, is there a clique of size five in this graph? No, is there a clique of six in this graph? No, because there are not even six vertices. So is there a clique of size one here? So can there be a clique of size one? I mean, there will just be one node then, right? Yes, this is a clique of size one. Yes, there are many cliques of size one. This is a clique 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 of size one. So all those vertices, individual vertices are the cliques of size one. So if there are N vertices in a graph, an undirected graph, then there are exactly N cliques of size one, right? This is by default. This is the trivial solution. Is there a clique of size two? Yes. Yes. There are, mul there are multiple cliques of size two. So this is one of them. The other one, the other one, the other one and the other one. So there are many cliques of size two. Is there a clique of size three? Yes, I just showed you there. there is a clique of size three. Are there multiple cliques of size three? No, there's only one clique of size three, right? So what is the maximum size of clique in this graph? Three, because there is no clique of size four or five and, and so on. So 
So we define this clique language as following. <clears throat> Clique consists of a description of a graph G and K such that G has a clique of size at least K. Okay. So this is a language. All such graphs, all such undirected graphs, which have Clicks of size one or two or three or four or whatever number of K will be in this language. So I have a theorem which says that click is in class NP. Can you prove it? So let me rewrite here. So if it's in the class NP, then we must have a solution and then we can verify it using a verifier? Yes. So there are two definitions. So we can either go with the verification uh, route or we can go with the non-deterministic um, Turing machine route, right? So non-deterministic Turing machine route is usually the difficult one and uh, it's, it's harder to, to uh, define that machine. So the easier way is to, to verify. So can anyone tell me a very simple algorithm, a very simple verification algorithm, which verifies a clique in any given undirected graph in polynomial time, deterministically. And if you can come up with such an algorithm, you have basically the proof for this theorem. Sir, so for the, uh, the first step should be the solution. We should have the solution, right? Yes. So once we have that, we can check if that solution, um, uh, first of all, it should have the number of nodes that the uh, problem is asking us for. Yeah, so suppose there is a solution and solution says that there are vertices x1, x2, x3, okay? Okay, and okay. I say that, these vertices form a peak of size k, for example. Okay, how, how do we check it? So what we need to do, we just need to look at all these k vertices. So these k designated vertices and check the degree of each and every vertex here. Okay, that is, is the degree of x1 k minus one and does it connect to the remaining uh, vertices from the set or not? If it does, we check for X1. Then we do the same for X2. Then we do the same for X3 and so on. If it happens that it, this, if we say that it checks out for all vertices in this list, it means that this is a click. And the time complexity of this process is definitely polynomial. Why polynomial? Suppose these are the X1, X2, XK vertices, right? So this is X1, this is X2, this is X3, and this is X2. Now all these vertices will be connected, right? All these vertices will be connected. <clears throat> I'm not showing all, all the edges uh, because it, it, will, it will be a mess. But what we need to do, we come to the first vertex and check, does it connect to the rest of the vertices? If it does, then check. Then go to the next vertex and check, does it connect to all the vertices? If it does, yes, it's okay. And you do everything. Now, each vertex is connected to exactly n minus one vertex. Sorry. Sorry. There are k vertices. So each vertex is connected to k minus one vertex, right? If it takes O of one time to check one edge, then it will take O of k time to check all the vertices. And since there are k vertices, so it will take k times O of k, which is O of k squared, O of k squared time to verify. And k is the size of the input. Uh, I mean, k is the size of the certificate, actually. And this k is definitely less than or equal to n, which where, where, where n is the size of the 
uh, I mean the entire graph. So O of K square is basically O of N square. And this is polynomial. Therefore, verification can, can be done deterministically on, um, I mean, it can be done deterministically in polynomial time. Therefore, this problem is in NP. Can you please read the part where you uh, came up with OK square? Your voice lagged over there. Okay. So, how many vertices we have in total? K vertices. Right? And for each vertex, each vertex, K minus one vertices, exactly K minus one vertices are connected. Right? If it takes one step to check if a vertex is connected to another vertex, and if there are k minus one vertices, it will take k minus one steps, right? And there are such there are k vertices for each vertex. We need to do this thing. So for each vertex, we have to have k minus one steps. So there are k vertices. So we have k times k minus one, which is O of k square, which is in turn O of n square. Oh, okay, sir, I got it. Thank you. Okay, is this in clear? Okay, there are other problems yes. as well. Um, there is a problem called subset sum. Let me say that this problem is also NP. And uh, there are many other problems. And uh, there's this problem called sorting. It is also an NP, and there are many other problems. So whenever we say there are problems with NP, what you need to do, you have to come up with uh, a verification algorithm. Okay. So is this thing clear? Is everything clear so far? So far, so good. Yes, sir. So what is the okay. problem? Yes, subset sum. Uh, okay. So subset sum problem is um, is a problem where, where we are given a set. Just give me a second. So let me uh, let me write the formal definition of set. So given a set S and T. Such that S is equal to X1, XK. Okay. So this problem says that suppose you are given a set of numbers, k numbers, and you are also given a number t. Okay. So let, let's say an example. Suppose s is uh, 3, 5, uh, 0, minus 1, uh, 2, 10, 15, and let's say 8. And I say that t is equal to, let's say, 23. These are just arbitrary numbers. So I ask you, maybe let's make this T smaller so that it's easier to verify. So let's say I tell you this is equal to uh, 17. Okay. So I ask you, is there a subset of S such that Sum of so let's say is there a subset y of the set S such that sum of elements of y is equal to t. So can you figure out some elements of S such that when you add all those elements in in, in y, you get the number seventy? Is it possible? So there are many solutions. For example. If you say that my y1 is a solution, first solution, which is 2 and 15, 
Yes, 2 and 15 is 17, right? There is another solution. Is there any other solution? Uh, there is another solution. 10, 5, 2. 18 and minus 1. 18 and minus 1. There is another solution, which is uh, um, 10, 5, 3, 5, minus 1, and 10, and 10, 5, and 2. Uh, y4 is, is 10, uh, 5, and 2. And there are many other solutions, right? If such a solution exists, then we say that it's a subset sum problem. So the subset sum problem says that there exists such a set. So in this particular case, so this particular case, so I, if I pass this S and 17 together uh, as, as a check to subset sum, so the answer by the TM would be except. Why except? Because such a subset exists. Right now, suppose I send the same set S and I say uh, the number is 125. Okay, and I ask, does it belong to the subset sum? The corresponding TM should reject it, right? Because there is no subset of these numbers such that the sum of those numbers is exactly equal to 125. Right, so this is called the subset sum problem. The subset sum problem is also an NP. Why does NP? because it may be very difficult to solve this problem, but given a solution, what you need to do, you just check the sum of that. For example, if I said, this is a solution, what you need to do? You just add the numbers in that set and see if that numbers add up to 70. Yes, two plus 15 is 70. 18 minus one is 70. Three plus five minus one, 10 is 70, and so on and so forth. So you just need to verify. And this addition can be done in polynomial time because uh, you are just looking at a subset of K numbers. Right, so there were initially k numbers. So you look at a subset of k numbers, and that k and that number could, would be either equal to k or less than k. So you need to just do those many additions, and, and each addition can be done in in constant time. So it's it's fun now. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. So, any any other question? So when we say class P, it means that membership can be decided quickly. When we say NP, we say that membership can be verified quickly. Okay. So the difference between P and NP is that it can be decided quickly, it can be verified quickly. That is, we may not be able to come up with a solution very quickly when it is NP, but given a solution, we can figure out that whether it is correct or not, right? So, so what we have uh, as a relationship is that we have P and then we have uh, NP. So we, we know that P is a subset of NP, okay? but we do not know if NP is also a subset of P. It is unknown. Okay? If a set A is a subset of set B and set B is a subset of set e, A, then definitely A is equal to B, right? So let's say A is equal to one, two, three, and four, and B is equal to one, two, three, and four. Then we know that A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A. Therefore, A is equal to B. And this is how, this is exactly actually the, the, the way we define two sets as equal. We say that, we say a set A is equal to set B if and only if, if and only if A is a subset of B and B is a subset of, this is the definition of equal. So we do not know if P is equal to NP, we do not know, okay? So, but we know that P is a subset of NP, so we do not know the other way. If you can prove this other way, then we know that P is equal to NP. And as I said uh, before, uh, as I told you, uh, that this, this is an open question. And this has been open since, uh, I think, since the times of Turing, 
I think Turing also knew about it. I'm not sure if he actually, I mean, he knew about this problem in its exact form, uh, but I think he was aware of it. And it is, it is uh, open since then and nobody has been able to solve. Uh, there have been multiple attempts to solve this uh, uh, question. And uh, most of those attempts have been futile. Uh, actually, there have been some uh, papers in literature uh, like 30, 40 years ago, and maybe a little bit earlier, uh, people, I mean, they were so excited about this problem that they, they would solve it and they will, they, they will claim that they have a solution, they will publish it, uh, they will send it to the, to, the, to the journal and the journal will look at the solution and they will see that it's correct and they will publish it. And they would find after it has been published that no, it is not correct because there was some fault, there was some error in the proof and they have to retract it. So, so there have been many attempts to prove it uh, to a point that now most computer scientists and mathematicians uh, even do not consider solving. Okay, and uh, and there are actually two classes uh, of people. Uh, there are some people who think that p is equal to np. We do not have any proof. There are some people who think that p is not equal to np. Okay, uh, majority of people think that p is not equal to np, but there are still some people who think that p is equal to np. Um, so I have talked with some of the researchers in the field and, uh, and some mathematicians have this strong feeling that maybe one day we will be able to show that P is equal to NP, while others are of the view that one day we will be able to show that P is not equal to NP. Uh, I have not, I mean, uh, made up my mind yet. I mean, I've been thinking about it for a very long time. And sometimes I prefer P, I think that, yeah, maybe P is equal to NP. And other times I think, no, P may not be equal to NP. Uh, but since there is no proof, so we are struggling, right? So, uh, but anyway, if, if P equal to NP, it has consequences. It has major consequences. It has major consequences if P equal to NP. Because as we, uh, as we will go into, go deep into theory of complexity, uh, computational complexity, we will see that many results in complexity, uh, many results in uh, algorithms depend on this fact. They assume, so those results assume that, as, they say that assume P is not equal to NP. And if it is not equal to NP, the following result for, okay? So all those results, and there are not just one or two or few, there are many, many, many results which assume that P is not equal to NP. Okay, and then they proceed. So if P happens to be equal to NP, that is, there is no difference between P and NP, but then all those results have to be rewritten, right? So they will collapse. Those results will collapse. They will no longer be correct. And all those results have to be redone. But on the other hand, uh, if somebody proves that P is not equal to NP, uh, then again, uh, we know that wherever we assume that P is not equal to NP, and we thought that we might have uh, someday have some good result about those results. We know for sure that there is no good, result, right? So there are major consequences for both P equal to NP and P not, is not equal to NP, uh, but P equal to NP have even drastic consequences. And if P happens to be equal to NP, uh, then our encryption system, all our online uh, privacy will be affected, heavily affected. All of our communication uh, that happens online uh, using our WhatsApp or FaceTime or Skype or emails or, or any chat or any, anything that travels through, through internet, whenever you open your browser and you write uh, uh, some URL and the data that that uh, server sends you back to your, to your browser, uh, that is encrypted using algorithms which assume that P is not equal to NP. So if P is equal to NP, then most probably those algorithms will break and online privacy has to be, uh, I mean, somebody has to rethink about all those algorithms, right? So that's why most people think Sir, that P is not has, um, Please go ahead. Sir, why do they want to solve it then? Like why, do want, why do they want to prove P is equal to NP when we already know that it will have major consequences like 
No, so major, that, that's exactly why do we need to solve it? I mean, we don't want to remain in dark, right? So we cannot just bury our head in, in sand and assume that all is there, right? So we need to know whether P is equal to NP or not equal to NP, right? So if P is equal to NP, we know it's a major consequence. So everything that we have done uh, about online privacy is, 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 is wrong, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Suppose there is some uh, uh, malicious uh, party, uh, there's some group, of people or government or somebody who know that P is not P is equal to NP. They've proved it, but they are not, not showing the result to anyone. So if they know P is equal to NP, they know they have they have broken down all the online privacy, right? So they can uh, eavesdrop anyone. Right? That's why it is important for us to know if if really P is not equal to NP or P is equal. To NP. So that's why we want to solve it. So if P is equal to NP, we know that our privacy will uh, will be shattered, but then we will think more and come up with results which will not depend on this result whether P is equal to NP or not. So we will come up with new new techniques. Right now, all techniques, not all, most of the techniques depend on this assumption uh, that P is not equal to NP. But there are some minority of mathematicians and computer scientists who still think that P is equal to NP, and they have been trying to prove it this way. <clears throat> So there, there is actually a movie, Hollywood movie as well, uh, where the American government, I think CIA, uh, calls some mathematicians and computer scientists and they give them millions of dollars and, and put them in a room and give them some time to solve this question. And ultimately they come up with the solution that, and they prove that P is equal to NP. And then there are some, uh, I mean, drastic and uh, violent um, kind of consequences for those people and for government. So, so people have been thinking about it. It's, it's, it's been in fiction for a very long time. Uh, so anyway, so this is important. Um, anyway, so let's, let's take a break for 10 minutes, maybe 12 minutes and come back at 4, 7.45. Okay, and we will talk more about the end. Thank you. I I'll see you in uh, 10 to 12 minutes. Okay. Uh, okay, so let us start. And uh, let us continue with our discussion. <clears throat> so we, we do not know whether P is equal to NP or not. Um, in, in about NP, we, we have so many doubts. Uh, but there is one uh, result. So remember D time and N time. Similarly, we have one more thing, which we call exp time. Okay, what is exp time? Exp time refers to exponential time. But this is deterministic. Definitely, if there's a deterministic version, there must be a non-deterministic version, which we call n exp time, but we are not going there. So what is this exp time? So this exp time is defined as, so we will not go into detail that what is this exp time, exp time, but however is defined as, as union of all those languages, uh, which can be accepted or decided in deterministic time uh, where two power n power k for every k greater than, uh, let's say one. <clears throat> so we have a result. And that result says that NP is definitely a subset of EXP time.
So, sir, is EXP time a set, uh, sorry, a class as well? Yeah, EXP time is a class as well. Okay, so we have something like this. So we know P, and then we know that P is contained within NP, but we do not know whether P and NP are the same or not. Uh, so maybe there is a boundary here, maybe there is no boundary here, so we do not know. So we do not know if it exists or not. But then there is this EXP time. So NP is within EXP time. Okay. And there are other classes as well, which are above EXP time. And one of them is in EXP time. Uh, but we do not know if there is any other class which is more than NP, but less than EXP. We do not. Okay, we do not. Okay. Anyway, this leads to an important uh, aspect of this class NP, uh, which we call NP completeness. So what is meant by NP completeness? <clears throat> so when we talk about P and NP, um, so when we talk about this question of P versus NP and um, so when mathematicians were talking about these things in 60s and 70s, uh, they came across some problems uh, which were in NP, such that their complexity was related uh, to that of the entire class. So, so if you just look at this class NP, so forget about P. So let's say this is class NP, right? So there are many problems. So we know sorting is there, subset sum is there, clique is there, and there are many other problems here. All problems in P are also here, right? So when, we, when, when those mathematicians uh, and computer scientists uh, were looking at the, NP, in the class NP, the complete class NP, they came across some problems uh, which they identified such that the complexity of these individual problems was something that could be related to the complexity of the entire class of, uh, of, of, of NP. That is, they were a, as complex as any other problem in the class and a little bit more, okay? So for example, not all problems in this class NP are similarly complex because we know clique is NP. We know that sorting is NP. Um, sir, can you please repeat the last statement? Your voice was not clear. Okay, so I, I'm just repeating. I'm saying that, so there, this class NP contains a lot of problems, right? Infinitely many problems. <clears throat> and not and the complexity of not each problem is same. Some problems are easier than the other. Uh, for example, why? Because we, we know that P is a subset of NP. So in P, we have easy problems. So by definition, all those easy problems are also in class NP, right? And therefore, not all NP problems are difficult, okay? Not all NP problems are difficult. And then there are some problems in NP which, for which we do not know whether we should we should uh, include them in, in in class P or we should not include them in class N, uh, NP or something like that, right? So there are some undecided things as well. So there are so the problems. So the complexity of the problems in this class NP is 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 variable. So some problems are more complex than the other problems, and so on. But when mathematicians were looking at this class NP when they were trying to categorize it they found some problems in this class which were very complicated than the rest of these classes, such that their complexity was comparable to the entire class, or they discovered that they are the most complex problems, and they gave those problems a name which we call NP-complete, okay? So this means that NP-complete problems are the problems which we call they are complete for the class NP. So what, is, what does it mean by complete? I, I will explain later on, but, try, but, but just looking at some of the problems in the class NP, we find that some problems are more complicated than the other, and NP complete problems are the most complicated problems. For example, K 
clique is NP complete. Okay, but sorting is not NP complete. Okay, and why it is the case, it will be clear. Uh, but but the important thing right now here is that there are problems in in the class NP which are more uh, complicated than the rest of the problems. Clique is one of those problems. Uh, but those mathematicians, especially there was a mathematician, Stephen Cook and uh, uh, Levin, uh, who came up with some results. And those results, so the very first problem that they identified is called satisfiability problem. Let me explain what is the satisfiability problem. And then we will talk about that. How did they categorize this problem to be an NP complete problem? We will not go into the complete proof, but I will give you some outline that why it is the case. So let's see what is the satisfiability problem. Okay. Uh, so I, I believe uh, with, with, with discussion that will follow from this point onwards, I, I hope that you all are familiar with uh, some Boolean algebra. You must have done it in either in discrete maths or digital logic and design. Yes, sir, we did it. Okay, so you must have done. So you know some circuits, uh, I mean, and or circuits and not circuits and things like Boolean algebra, right? So simple Boolean algebra. Suppose I write some expression and I say that I have an expression which says X naught, X complement and Y or X and Y complement. It is a Boolean expression. Why? Because both X and Y are Boolean variables. What is a Boolean variable? A Boolean variable is a variable so that X can either be zero or X can be one, right? Or if, if we talk about the computer programming, zero means false one means true, right? So it can only be true or false. So we will talk about only those expressions and formula which are which we construct using Boolean variables and Boolean variables are those variables which can either be zero or one, right? So I can say that this expression or formula is some formula phi and this is a Boolean formula. Now, the question is, given a Boolean formula, phi, okay, is there some truth assignment to the variables? Phi such that it is satisfied. What is meant by satisfied? So let's take this example. Let me rewrite here. So phi is x complement uh, and y or x and y complement. Right? So such formulas are called C and F. Sorry, this is not CNF. We will come back to that. Anyway, so in this formula, if I say, if I say that X is one and Y is uh, zero, okay? Suppose X is zero, X is one and Y is zero, then what is phi? Phi is one complement and zero or one and zero complement, right? So one complement is zero, zero and zero, or one and one, which is equal to one, right? Now the value of phi is one, so we say that phi is satisfied. So whenever the formula is evaluated to be one, that is true, for some values, some assignments, truth assignments to its variables, we say that the formula is satisfied. Is this thing clear? 
Uh, sir, uh, any values of x and y that will lead the formula to be equal to 1 will be called the uh, truth assignment? Yes. So truth assignment means that okay. truth assignment means what does it mean by truth assignment? Suppose there is a variable x, there is a variable y, there is a variable z and so on and so forth. Then assigning x equal to 1 or x equal to 0 or any such value, any Boolean value is called truth assignment. So we are assigning some value to these variables. So assigning values to the variable is called truth assignment. Okay. So for example, uh, we have arithmetic or algebraic expressions. For example, uh, 2x minus 1 is equal to 0. Right. Or let's say, no, this is not a good example. So let's say we have a formula A, uh, which is 2x minus 1. So is there, is there any assignment to x which makes, for example, A equal to 0? Is there any value of x which when we assign uh, in this formula such that the whole thing becomes zero. Yes, if we assign x is equal to two, uh, sorry, if we assign x is equal to half, then two times half minus one is equal to zero, right? So this is this is in the domain when we talk about uh, real variables or uh, variables from algebra. But when we talk about variables from Boolean algebra, we assign only true value or false value. And this assignment of true or false is called truth assignment assignment of truth, right? So if there exists a truth assignment to each variable of some formula phi such that phi becomes one, then we say phi is satisfied, right? So if there exists one assignment, any such assignment, so there might be multiple assignments, but we are only interested if there exists only one, if there exists one. So if exists one, that's fine. If there exists two, that's also okay, but we are only interested in knowing if some assignment exists. If some assignment exists was such that the value of the whole formula is equal to one or the whole value of the whole formula is true, then we say that the formula is satisfied, okay? Now, based on it, we define a language set. We say set contains all such formulas, those description of the formulas, such that phi is a Boolean formula, okay? And it is satisfied. So this is the, the language which we call set. This is the problem which we call set. Now, given any arbitrary formula, let's say I, I say the psi is, is an arbitrary formula, I need to find, figure out if psi belongs to set or not, okay? So it means that we are, uh, we want to find out the membership of psi in set, right? My claim is that set is in NP. This is very easy to prove. Can anyone prove set is NP? Of course it is NP, why? Because we can verify, right? So if I give you a formula phi and I give you uh, a truth assignment, to each variable of this formula, you can always verify. So you just assign that uh, each variable with that value and check where does it evaluate? What I'm does sorry, it evaluate? your voice is lagging a lot. I'm sorry, I don't so know what's the problem. I'm sorry, what's the problem? Uh, uh, is it okay now? Yeah, but in between it lags a lot. Uh, okay, whenever it does- the last few things you say. Yeah, whenever it does, please let me know. <clears throat> Okay, sir.
So the question is, is satisfiability the set problem NP or not? And my claim is that yes, it is NP. Why it is NP? Because we can verify it very quickly. Given a formula phi in a truth assignment, we can just evaluate the formula and check if it evaluates to true or not. If it does evaluate to true, it is satisfiable. If it does not evaluate to true, it is not satisfied, right? So to test it, we can come up with a very simple polynomial time algorithm, which does this job. Therefore, set is NP, okay? Set is NP. Okay, sir. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, but we started with the discussion about NP completeness. Okay, we will later on prove that that set is NP complete. Remember, I haven't defined what is meant by NP complete as yet. But my claim is that set is NP complete, and we will talk about NP complete base in detail right now. Okay, but before we begin, is there any other question? Okay. No. Okay, and before we move, I will give, I, I will just make one claim without any proof, and then maybe we will come back to this proof. My claim is that there's a theorem. When I say it's a theorem, it means it's a right claim, and there's no question about it. It says that set is in class P, if and only if P is equal to, okay? Okay, so if you okay. want to look at visually, so this is the class P, and this is the class NP. So you are saying that this problem set, which is here, goes inside this P, if and only if there is no boundary between P and NP. In other words, it means that this problem remains same. It, this problem remains here. And we expand or we break down or collapse the boundary of P and NP. Okay, we will not go into much detail about this result right now, but this is just, uh, for you to remember, okay? Is this thing clear? Okay, now we will talk about something that we have already talked about when we were talking about, um, uh, when we were talking about decidedly, okay? So do you remember reduction? We spend a lot of time on reduction, right? So we have a problem A, we have a problem B. We say that A reduces to B. Then we say that, what does it mean by A reduces to B? It means that we can use the solution to B to solve the problem A and so on and so forth. Do you remember that? Yes, sir. Okay. Now we have a qualification of this reduction we come up with a definition which is called polynomial time so let's let's first of all define what is polynomial time computable functions so we say that a function f that maps some strings to another strings is a polynomial time computable function if some polynomial M exists that halts with just f of w on its 
okay. and start it on any input. Okay. So over here, the function f is a function from sigma star to sigma star. That is f maps strings to strings. Okay, it maps some strings to other strings. So you can, for example, define the function reverse. That is given any w, so the reverse of w is w reverse, right? For example, reverse of 0, 1, 0, 0, 1 is 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, okay? So f is such a function that maps strings to strings. So the input is a string, output is a string, and then, then it does some computation. But we would call that computation polynomial time computable function. We would call this function f polynomial time computation. If this process can be done on a deterministic Turing machine in polynomial. Okay, and not only that, when W is sent as the input to some Turing machine M, then F of W is written on the output. Okay, so um, you can imagine sir, can there you is a- repeat, Can you please repeat the uh, mapping thing that you were talking about? So, so is this thing what clear? Do you, uh, what do you mean by string to string? This, no, is this thing clear? Actually, no, no, your voice started to break in between. Okay. So F is a function that maps some strings to other strings. Remember function which are from natural numbers to natural numbers? Suppose G is a function which is from, which is from natural number to natural number. Uh, let's say G of N is 2N minus one. Then whatever in, in uh, natural number you will provide as N, you will get a natural number at the end, right? <clears throat> Same thing happens here. So this f is a function that maps strings to strings, okay? So suppose f is a function that maps strings to strings. Suppose our sigma is zero and one, and I define this function f of w to be whatever that is w concatenated with zero, okay? So whatever is the W, we just concatenate zero at the end. So what is F of W? Uh, what is F of zero? Zero, zero, zero? zero. What is F of one? One, zero. What is F of one, one? It's one, one, zero. So whatever is the input, we would just put a zero at the end, right? Similarly, I can say that I have a function R and this function just reverses, reverses W, right? Then R of zero one is one zero, right? R of one one zero zero is zero zero one one and so on and so forth, right? So we call this function from sigma star to sigma star. It maps strings to strings. So the input is a string, output is a string. So we can think about this way. Suppose this is our Turing machine M. We provide this W on the input of the Turing machine. Then the output of the Turing machine is F. Okay. If M runs in polynomial time, then F is called polynomial time computable function. Okay, very simple. Okay, sir. Okay, now with this polynomial time computable function, we define polynomial time reducibility. We say that a language
a this polynomial time mapping reducible or simply polynomial time deducible to language D and we write it as this, right? Written as A less than equal sign. And we have this capital P here. This P represents polynomial time. Okay. If a polynomial time computable function f from sigma star to sigma star exists where w is a string in the language a if and only if if and only if f of w is a string in the language b okay so we say that the function f is called polynomial time reduction of A to, okay? So there are a lot of things going on here. And I do not assume that you understand it simply by reading it. So I will do some examples and I will explain it further. So, but let me know if you did not understand anything. Okay, so let's do some, uh, let, let's do some explanation. <clears throat> so we say that this is suppose a language A. What is a language? Language is a, is a set of or collection of uh, strings, right? And this is the language B. Okay. Now, there are strings here. We map these strings to some string here using the function f. Remember the function f is a polynomial time computable function, which maps some strings to other strings. Okay. When such a thing exists, we would say that this polynomial time computable function is basically a polynomial time reduction of language A to language B. Okay. Remember language A is completely different from language B. So let's see. Let's see. A is a language. A is some language. Suppose there's sigma is simple 0 and 1, and A is a language uh, such that it consists of all such strings. Uh, w ends in, in, in 1, right? All strings over 0, 1 such that W ends in 1. So 0, 1 is in A. 0, 1, 0, 1 is in A. Epsilon empty is not in A and so on. Zero is not in A and so on. Now let's define our function F as a function of that takes W, okay? And where W is from A such that it puts W, okay? And puts one, one at the end. It concatenates one, one with the, okay? let's say one, zero. Okay, so whatever strings that are in A, okay, so you just take a string from A. So we know that zero one is in A. Then F of zero one is basically zero one, one zero. Okay, now if you collect all those strings, if you collect all those strings, then let's call that language B. That language B consists of all those strings W, such that W is from In this particular case, we say A reduces to B. Or in other words, we write A reduces to B. Why do we put this P? P means polynomial time. 
because this function can be carried out in polynomial form. Um, sir, so the language P will consist of all the strings uh, that will be formed by concatenating uh, each string belonging to A with one zero. Exactly. Right. So you can come oh. up with any different function. For example, uh, let's say A is a language, some language uh, over sigma, sigma star. Right. And let's say B is a language that is f of W such that W is from A. And I define f of W to be reverse of W. Now, B is a language that contains all those strings which are in A, but they reverse, right? Let's say A contains uh, 0, 1, and uh, 0, 0, 1, and 1, 0, 0, and let's say 1, 1, 0, something like that, right? Then what will B contain? B will contain 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, and 0, 0, 1, and 0, 1, 1, and so on, so forth, right? So these two languages are different. These two languages are different, okay? So we have language A, we have language B, but we have been able to reduce A to B, okay? Now, why do we need to do this thing? This reduction is important because suppose there exists some TMM that decides B. We do not know if there is a, a, a TM that decides A, okay? We do not know anything about A or its TM, but we know there exists a TM that decides B, okay? And we also know that A reduces to B in polynomial time, then we can, we can convert that reduction in the other direction to solve A using B. So we can solve the membership problem for the class A, for the language A, using a Turing machine that is designed for the language B. And why we can do that? We can do that because the function F is a one-to-one -one correspondence, right? It's a reduction. Remember, there was if and only if somewhere? Remember, W is in A if and only if F of W is in B. That is, if I give you W, you can give me FW. If I give you FW, you can give me W. So it means that it is in both directions. So we can go from A to B, and we can also come back from B to A. It's an if and only if kind of thing, right? That's why, if we know there is a Turing machine that decides B, and we do not know what is a Turing machine that decides A, we can use the Turing machine that decides B to decide A, okay, using B reduction. Is this thing clear? Yes, sir, but how do we figure out this function F, W? Like if that we, for is... example, have this language A, and we have to use it to uh, B, then, Will we have to find this function f w first? That is that is the million dollar question, right? So we always have to figure out what is the function f. And that function f is basically the reduction. So for every two languages, this will be different. So whenever we have two problems, we have a known problem, um, we have a known problem b and an unknown problem a, unknown in a sense that we do not know a solution to, to a. But if we can if we can convert the a in such a way then it is suitable for B, then we can solve A, okay? And that, that actually requires creativity to figure out what it is. And we will find it out that how we can convert this, this or how can we carry out this reduction. So I hope that this reduction is, is clear. With this reduction, we have a result. And this result says that if A is a language, which reduces to B in polynomial time, and B is a language that is already in that, that is already known to be in, in class P, then A is also in P. 
okay? So if A reduces to B and B is known to be a class in, 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 in the class P, then A is also in class P. And remember, it's just one directional if, it's not two directional if. Okay, can you prove it? The proof is very simple, very, very simple. So suppose so if, M, uh, yes, please go ahead. No, sorry, I was uh, I was saying something else, but I got it figured out. Okay, suppose M is a Turing machine that decides B, okay? If M decides B and we already know that B is, is P, right? And imagine that F is uh, a polynomial time reduction from A to B. That is A reduces to B in polynomial time reduction, right? So we know that A reduces to B and it reduces using the function F, okay? So we can construct a new machine N, which on input W, what it will do? It will compute first of all, f of w and how we can we how can we make sure that f of f of w can be computed because we know that f is a computable function and it's not just computable function it's polynomial time computable function and polynomial time computable function means that there exists a deterministic Turing machine which does this in polynomial time and once we are done with that we would run m on f of w because m runs on f of w right when we run M on F of W, then whatever M outputs, we will output as the output of N, okay? Output, whatever M outputs. That's it, it is the proof. So what is M here? N is a new machine. See? We did not know how to <clears throat> how to decide A. We did not know. We only knew that we, we know how to decide B. And suppose M decides B, okay? M decides B. <clears throat> then we can create a new machine N which decides A using the machine B, machine for B, okay? And since machine for B is deterministic and it is in polynomial time, and n must be deterministic and polynomial time. Why polynomial time? Because this step is polynomial time deterministic. This step is also polynomial time deterministic. So n is a polynomial time deterministic. And whenever a machine decides something in deterministic, uh, deterministic on, on a deterministic machine in polynomial time, then that machine must be, that language must be in, in P. Therefore, this is the proof of the theorem. Okay, is this in clear? Yes, sir. Okay, now we will see that that satisfiability problem is not in B. Sir, okay? but you said that it's difficult to tell if a problem is not in the class B. Yes, so what I did here is I did not use uh, accurate words, we will not do this thing actually. So what we would do, we would show that set is something for which we would not be able to come up with our deterministic machine that runs in polytime. Unless P is equal to N. And if this is exactly what the theorem was, which I mentioned before I started talking about action. Okay, and with this we will prove, we will show that set is 
NT complete. Okay. And we will figure out that how to show something is NT complete. And we will do it in the next class. Sir, so, uh, we, did, we did not define what NP complete is. We have not yet. I still haven't defined what is NP complete. Yes. So we will do it will. in the next class? We will do it in the next class. Okay. And so next class, I think, is probably the last class. And I have been receiving some queries about the final exam. So uh, there is a policy, there's uh, a timing announced by NDA that we will have our final exam on August 3. It will be in person on campus. Uh, so far, uh, it will be in person on campus. But if there is any other development uh, by the government or by, by university, then things may change. So there is still some confusion around it. And I, have, I, I don't have any, uh, I mean, uh, exact fixed answer for that. Uh, so as soon as I find it out, I will let you know. Okay. Sorry, but I heard some teachers are taking it online. That is up to the teachers, but uh, so we may end up doing it, but I'm not sure. I, I will let you know in time. But in any case, um, exam will be on third of August. Um, sir, by when can we expect for you to let, let us know? Because there are a lot of students who will be coming from outside Karachi. They have to get their traveling exams done. Uh, yes, so hopefully I will have a definite answer by tomorrow. So before, I mean, I will let you know by, at most by Saturday. Okay. Okay. Sir, but there also, I think uh, the government is also shutting down all the travel, uh, intercity traveling as well. Yeah, that is so also a problem. I think yeah, some people who are out of city right now will have a problem coming back to here. Yeah, we, we have to figure it out. So let, let me talk with uh, with the chairperson uh, and then let me let me think about it. what sure, could be sir. the thank best you. way to do it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. If there is no more question about the uh, about the topic that we have been talking about, then I think we can end it here. And I will uh, see you on Saturday. Okay. Sorry, I have posted one question on chat. Uh, what is the question? What is the question? Sir, my, sir, my quiz three months are not uploaded yet. I, I will, I will check it. Don't worry. Okay, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Um, take care for the office. I'll see you on important topics for final. Uh, sorry, everything is important. Uh, sir, if we, if we want to discuss something related with practice set questions, uh, sir, how how could we approach you for that? Uh, just send me an email. Uh, so don't just ask me that how to solve some question. Uh, tell me that you tried somehow and you are stuck at some point and you cannot proceed further. Uh, just show me some of some of your work and, and let me know, and I will help you out from that point onwards. I will give you some hints. Uh, I will not give you the complete solution. I will give you some hints at how to proceed from that point. Sir, actually, I have some problem related with question number three of that practice set. Um, Can you send me an email? Exactly. I think we are already. Oh, of course, sir. Uh, uh, all right, sir. Yeah, please sure. send me an email. Okay. All right, sir. Or, or if you think that, that that is something that everyone can, it could be useful for everyone, then um, I think you can use the chat feature from LMS, right? Yeah, okay, sir, I will, I will. Okay. Okay, that's, uh, that's it. Thank you very much. I'll see you on Saturday. Thank you, take care for the office. For the office.